Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today's topic is the oculomotor nerve, that is the third cranial nerve. Okay. Well, we begin the description of the oculomotor nerve with its nucleus. The nucleus lies, as you can see, in the midbrain. This is the section through the midbrain. This section is at the level of the superior colliculus or superior corpus quadriginum. Now, the, here is the aqueduct, that is the cavity of the midbrain. In the floor of the aqueduct lies the nucleus. From there, fibers emerge, they go ventralwards. As you can see, they are passing through the red nucleus. They are passing through this body. This is called substantia nigra. They, they are, and having passed through substantia nigra, they come out of the basis pedunculi into this interval, that is the interpeduncular fossa. That is where the oculomotor nerve emerges. Now, having told you about the situation of the nucleus, I go on to the nucleus itself. Now here you see the oculomotor complex, that is, what parts the nucleus is made up of. Here it is the Edinger Westfall part. Here is the dorsal longitudinal part. The dorsal longitudinal part innervates the inferior rectus muscle. Then the intermediate part, that innervates the inferior oblique muscle. Then the ventral longitudinal part, that innervates another muscle. Now, medial to that, you see the red colored zone, that innervates the superior rectus. Whereas this yellow colored zone, lower down, innervates the medial rectus. Now, let's go behind and you see far back a purple colored mass. This mass is called the caudal central nucleus and the caudal central nucleus innervates both sides levator palpebrae superioris. The Edinger Westfall nucleus as you see here which is dorsal most and which you will see in another figure also it innervates the pupil. It brings about involuntary contraction of the pupil. Well, the last picture was a lateral view, but here you have a view of the right and the left oculomotor complexes seen from dorsal aspect, that's from top aspect. And in the midline you see the Edinger Westfall nucleus. It's seen quite properly. It's posteriorly, it is split into a median part and two lateral parts, but these parts, they join together to form a common mass anteriorly. That is the Edinger Westfall nucleus. This is the caudal central nucleus. Uh, you are seeing the interpeduncular fossa of the brain from the ventral aspect. Here, this is the pons, these are the cerebral peduncles, this is the optic chiasma, these are the optic tracts, here is the interpeduncular fossa, in which you see the mammillary body, the posterior perforated substance, and what is more important than these are the arteries. These two arteries are the posterior cerebral arteries. These two arteries are the superior cerebellar arteries. Now, this is being mentioned because the oculomotor nerve, as it emerges from the interpeduncular fossa, it passes between these two arteries and goes further for its course. Here you are seeing a coronal section passing through the skull and the cavernous sinus. This is the sphenoidal air sinus, this is the cavernous sinus and in this cavernous sinus you are seeing the venous blood and all the structures which pass through it. The oculomotor nerve travels in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus topmost that is, it is the uppermost structure. Below that is the trochlear nerve. Below that is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal and still below the maxillary division of the trigeminal. Within the cavernous sinus, you can see the internal carotid artery and the abducent nerve. Now, this means that as the oculomotor nerve is traveling in the cavernous sinus, it is superior to the trochlea. It is far superior to the internal carotid and it is traveling the lateral wall going forwards to approach the superior orbital fissure. Now, here is a schematic view, right-sided view of the right cavernous sinus. 
what we propose to show is this. In the proximal end of the cavernous sinus, the oculomotor nerve is most superior. But as it goes further forwards and as it approaches the superior orbital fissure, it inclines downwards. And at the same time, the other nerves, the trochlear nerve and the ophthalmic division of the fifth cranial nerve, they incline upwards. They pass lateral to the oculomotor and they come to a level more superior than the oculomotor. So as they emerge through the uh, superior orbital fissure into the orbit, the oculomotor nerve will be on a level lower than the trochlear and the branches of the ophthalmic division. Now, ladies and gentlemen, so far we have explained to you where the nucleus of the oculomotor lies. Then we have shown you how it passes through the midbrain. It comes out through the interpeduncular fossa between the posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar arteries. Then we have explained to you how it passes through the cavernous sinus and how it approaches the superior orbital fissure. Now in this picture, ladies and gentlemen, what we are trying to show you is the front view of the right orbital cavity. The pointer is moving on the anterior orbital aperture. Far behind, near the apex of the orbit, the superior orbital fissure is visible. Superior medial to the fissure is the optic foramen. And this purple colored ring is called the common tendinous ring. It is from the tendinous ring that many of the muscles take origin. Now, the, here you see oculomotor nerve entering through the superior orbital fissure. Here is the upper division, here is the lower division. The upper division is spent in the supply of rectus superior and levator palpebrae superioris. The lower division sends a branch which passes below the optic nerve medially to supply the medial rectus. Then it passes along, continues along the inferior rectus muscle. It gives a branch to the inferior rectus, not shown in this figure. Then it gives off a motor route to the ciliary ganglion. That is the ciliary ganglion. And then it continues as the nerve to inferior oblique. This is the way in which the oculomotor nerve, to, in, two, in the form of two divisions, is spent in supplying muscles. This transversely situated muscle here is the inferior oblique muscle. Now, having explained to you in a simple manner the course and distribution of the oculomotor, we give you an idea of the part played by the edinger westphal nucleus. Here, the edinger westphal nucleus is very schematically shown in two parts, an anterior part which is for pupil constriction and a posterior part which is for accommodation. Now, Please follow the fibers and how they pass. This is the edinger westphal nucleus. This is the schematic view of the oculomotor nerve. The both types of fibers, namely pupil constrictor as well as accommodation fibers, pass through the oculomotor nerve. They run through the lower division of oculomotor. Then they leave the lower division of oculomotor or the nerve to inferior oblique through the motor route to the ciliary ganglion. This is the motor root of ciliary ganglion. In the ganglion, you find the pupil constrictor fibers, which are green in color, they synapse. Postganglionic fibers go to the sphincter pupillae muscle in the iris. Then let's come back to the accommodation fiber. The accommodation fiber from the posterior part of the edinger westphal nucleus, that accommodation fiber runs similarly through the lower division of the oculomotor comes through the nerve to inferior oblique. It passes through the motor root, but most of these accommodation fibers do not synapse in the ciliary ganglion. They are said to synapse in episcleral and intrascleral ganglia, which go by the name of Axenfeld. There they synapse in the nerve cells and postganglionic fibers, which are naturally much shorter. They travel through the choroid and they reach the ciliaris muscle they bring about accommodation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, having finished in a simple manner the course and the divisions 
and the final branches and distribution of the oculomotor nerve. In conclusion, we have to, this much to say that the oculomotor nerve has two components, one for supply of the muscles moving the eyeball and the other for pupil constriction and accommodation. Now, if the oculomotor nerve gets paralyzed, if it is injured in any way, then what are the signs that this patient shows? The patient shows ptosis. Now, ptosis means dropping of the upper eyelid. The upper eyelid is more closed on the affected side than on the normal side. Moreover, the pupil constriction reaction or pupil constriction reflex is lost. And much more than that, the muscles which it supplies are paralyzed. Now, the superior oblique and the lateral rectus are not paralyzed. Therefore, the eyeball gets fixed in a lateral direction. So there is lateral trabiscus. These are the main and important uh, effects of oculomotor nerve paralysis.